Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. Hello, this is Michael Beverly. Welcome to Scripture Scrutiny Saturdays. This series I'm, series, I'm going through little sections of Scripture, starting in Mark. Full disclosure, I'm not a scholar. Let me go to the seminary. Why should you listen to me at all? You shouldn't listen to me as a teacher. I'm not. I'm, I'm acting as a reporter. I'm just going out and listening to some various teachings, looking at the text myself, comparing it to similar scriptures in other parts of the Bible, in this case, the other synoptic gospels, or John, if such a thing appears in John, and reporting back what seems to be issues, problems, contradictions. So if you're a Christian, one of the things I'd ask you is um, to ask yourself why, why it seems like an atheist like me is more interested in studying the Bible more than you. <clears throat> Maybe you should study the Bible more if you really believe it's an important book. It seems like you should know it. And the other question, and the other thing I want to point out, and this comes up in this in today's uh, in the scriptures from today, which is we're in Mark chapter one, and we are in verse twenty nine through thirty. I think it's thirty four. It's where uh, Jesus heals the mother in law of Simon Peter, and then people in the town bring all their sick and demon possessed, and and Jesus. Um, praise and heals a bunch of people. What I'd like you to ask yourself is when when a Christian teacher or apologist or your pastor, your minister, your priest tells you with extreme confidence what something means, but that's not actually what it says in the text. They're, they're rejecting, uh, well, it could be this way, or it seems that way, or it looks like it's that way. I want you to ask yourself, what training does this person that I'm trust, trusting have? Did they go to Bible college just to be a preacher or did they study New Testament uh, Greek or history? Did they study ancient history? Can they read Greek? Can they read Hebrew? And if not, maybe, maybe trusting them completely is misplaced because sometimes it's hard to tell when somebody's giving you their opinion because a lot of... I've, Listen to a lot of these apologists and, and our pastors, and they speak with extreme confidence as if they know what they're talking about. Yet you can listen to another person with the same confidence the same, and the same love for Jesus and say something different. And so you can almost say that in the morning of the Sabbath day, Jesus was casting out a devil, and for lunch he was healing the sick. Notice how he says you can almost say. Yeah, you could almost say anything. You could, I mean, you could, you could say on this day, maybe Jesus took a nap in the afternoon before he prayed to cast out demons, and that should be something Christians should consider. And then you could preach on a whole thing about how, you know, when you're working hard in the ministry and healing sick and casting out demons, you really need to take a nap. Do healings and blessings have to wait until after Sabbath? I'd like you to join me as we look at Mark 1, verse 29 to 34, and let's see how it goes here with Jesus. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with John, James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. One of the things that strikes me right away is that as soon as she's healed, she gets up and waits on them. And my, you know, my human instinct is like, wait a minute, she was sick. Like, give the woman a break. But implied in the text is that Jesus healed her completely and she was completely fine. So she just went about her normal life. And she began to serve them. She then gets up out of bed and begins to serve them. Now, What's interesting to me is if you've been around healing services, if you've been to, if you watch these healing things on YouTube, anybody that has a serious injury or something like um, deafness or blindness or partial deafness or blindness, or maybe a, um, a problem with their back or their leg that's visible when they go up for prayer, you'll quite often hear the person say, okay, well, Jesus has healed you, but it's still, the muscle's still a little bit atrophied. No pain. So you got a little bit of atrophy. You got to work your muscles. So you're, it's going to take some time to work it out. Or you've been healed, but you're still going to feel a little discomfort or something, blah, blah, blah. 
Well, no, that's not how that's not how it was modeled by Jesus. Like the healing is the healing's complete. So I just thought that was an interesting point. Now, uh, now there's let's finish up. Let, let's listen to the rest of the the scriptures. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. So in this, in, in Mark, this happens right after Jesus drives out the, the demon in the synagogue in, in uh, Capernaum. So um, as we talked about last week, this is, this, depending on which gospel you read, that was Jesus' like opening miracle. And then people started saying, oh, wait, who is this guy? So he goes to Simon Peter's, Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house. She has a fever. Now, what's interesting, if you look at Matthew, this, this scene happens in, all the way in chapter 8. So there's like Matthew adds all kinds of other stuff that Jesus did. And now, of course, you can argue it wasn't. Matthew wasn't trying to make a, a true chronological story about Jesus. And you can say that Mark didn't feel the stuff that happened in Matthew that that Matthew includes was, wasn't important to Mark for some reason because he was being more abbreviated. Now, remember, Mark's written first. Like pretty much everyone agrees on that skeptic to fundamentalist. Like the, that that seems like not a – now the, the – the authorship and the dating of Mark, of course, is in great dispute. But Markian priority, meaning it was written before Matthew and Luke, I, it's very hard to dispute that because Matthew and Luke copy often verbatim, word for word, Mark. So it's very difficult to say that Mark wasn't written first. What I found interesting is in Mark chapter 8, uh, Jesus... Uh, Jesus enters Capernaum and a, a centurion comes asking for help. And and Jesus asks, shall I come and heal him? And the centurion replies, no, I don't, I don't deserve you to come to my house under my roof. But if just by your word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, man, nobody, nobody has this great a faith. And, uh, you know, it's a stab at the Jews, of course. And then Jesus said to the centurion, go, it was, it's, you know, let it be done just as you believed it would. And it says the servant was healed at this moment. And then it segues into this is I'm in Matthew eight fourteen. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother in law lying in bed with a fever. Now in in Mark, of course, Peter and his brother Simon and the and the disciples make it immediately known to Jesus that Peter's mother in law has a fever. Whereas in Matthew, all of a sudden, Jesus doesn't need to be told. He just knows. And then Matthew also adds that this was to fill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Um, I'm not quite sure how Jesus healing people is him bearing the diseases or taking up the infirmities. I don't know. So a lot of times stuff gets added in there. It seems just to quote, oh, Jesus fulfilled prophecy, but it, you know, it's just cherry picked out of the Old Testament. Slight correction here. There is no such thing as the Old Testament when they're writing the Gospels. They're cherry picking out of the Septuagint. So this particular uh, set of verses that, that Matthew refers to, he pulls out of the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation. Now, never mind going down that rabbit trail because there's a lot of problems there. This now the Jews don't see this this quote suffering service suffering servant she sells seashells. I'm gonna get these S's down. Suffering servant. Nailed it. Um, things as being prophetic about the Messiah and and the Christians, of course, do. But part of the problem is, is when the gospel writers pull stuff out of the Septuagint and the Septuagint has made anywhere from big changes to little changes, you often get conflicts where, well, wait a minute. How is it that they're quoting the 
Septuagint, the Greek version, when it's made a mistake and cl and claiming that that proves prophecy or that that you know or that Jesus or somebody said something, you, you get the problem here. So and we don't have time to get into that today, but I highly recommend looking at some of these things, including the biggest mistake of all or the biggest. I think the biggest thing that proves. It, it unravels the whole thing, and that's how the word virgin is translated. So in Luke, it says Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of, of Simon, and then Simon's mother-in-law has a fever. He bent over and rebuked the fever. So this is a slight addition that he rebuked the fever, and it left her, and she got up, and then it goes on. But, but what I found interesting in verse 41, you know, I'm in Luke, I'm in Luke chapter 4. So Luke does... Luke, Luke also has a little bit of stuff happening before he gets to this scene. And it says, Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because he, he they knew he was the Messiah. But what's interesting in Mark is it simply says that um, he drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. So apparently... The, the phrase won't let them speak didn't mean them shouting you are the son of god because in my mind that's speaking so in my mind luke is contradicting mark now of course in the apologist's mind they'll say no but even even luke said he didn't allow them to speak meaning give a speech you see how this game's played anytime there's anytime there's something that is obviously not what it says it says then it gets changed to say what you want it to say. He left the synagogues and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Uh, I found this this clip interesting, not so much because he's you know he's just teaching about the same the same stuff the other people are teaching about. But he put on his screen this, this Bible software, and it got me thinking, if, if God really wanted to reveal Jesus and the truth and the ministry and what you should believe and how you should practice Christianity, why is it that you would need this complex software or any college education or any you know deep dive into the greek and hebrew and why is it that there's so much disagreement about what these things say and and why is it there's so many people that teach confidently opposite things and or say things like well if you if you connect this dot to this dot to this dot it clearly shows you that this certain thing is true this is really something as a Christian you really, really, really need to think about. If you can't just pick up your Bible and just read the Gospels or anything and just have it be clear to you and be confident that what it that what you're understanding is actually the truth, then you either worship a God that doesn't want you to be informed, like he wants you to be confused, or you have to think that God is telling you the truth through the Holy Spirit and your interpretation. And everybody that agrees you, disagrees with you, and trust me, that's going to be a lot of people and probably sometimes the majority of other Christians, depending on your belief, like how God allowed all them to be deceived. Like really think about that because it's it's something that if you really, really think about you will have to admit you're mostly in the dark or you'll have to take a stance of extreme arrogance that you're just smarter than most people and that God talks to you in a way that's clear and true, but He, but he's a trickster God for all the other Christians that think other things than you think. Now, which is it? Is God a trickster God or is he only giving you the right message and denying it everybody else? They went from sunset to sunset. Okay, so she got up and worked on the Sabbath to serve them. Whoa, I had never even thought of that. That's, an, that's a huge aha for me. So, okay, so she broke the Sabbath to serve. And you know what? That was okay. 
because the Sabbath, and Jesus said this, it's not for me. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Pharisees would have been very picky about this. They didn't like Jesus healing on the Sabbath, and they wouldn't have approved of Simon Peter's mother-in-law making a meal on the Sabbath. You were supposed to prepare food the day before, so you did not have to cook on the Sabbath. But she did because she was so thankful. She was rejoicing. And that was an illustration of the point that I just made. So here's a woman and, and she's teaching on the Bible and I'm sure her heart's in the right place and I'm sure she believes what she's teaching, but she's completely full of shit. And I don't think she's lying. I think she's just deluded herself. So first of all, she says, the Sabbath was from sun to sunset to sunset, okay? fact like that's the one thing i think she said that's actually true accurate and there's no dispute about so we agree what the sabbath is then she goes on to say whoa uh, simon peter's mother-in-law broke the sabbath really does the text say that no the text says that she got up and served them nowhere in the text does it say that she prepared or cooked now, I, I looked up because I was curious, like, what actually was prohibited in relation to food? Like, you're allowed to eat. <laughs> like, it's not like you're forced to fast through the Sabbath. Now, yes, there are, there are different schools of thought of exactly what work is. And I know it can get very extreme, like Jews that won't even push the button on the elevator. I get that. But she, she describes the Pharisees as having these certain things that she's confident about. Like the Pharisees would have been pissed off that, that this mother-in-law, which by the way, why can't, why didn't they put the name of, like quite often women aren't named, like be, besides the fact she's just getting up out of bed and immediately serving the men, they don't even give her a name, but okay. So she's, she, she according to this According to this Christian, she's breaking the Sabbath, but that's not what the Bible, or, you know, the verses here say. And I looked in, okay, this scene doesn't happen in John, so we're stuck with the synoptics. The synoptics have some slight variations, but they all say that they serve, that she served them or, you know, like got up to meet their needs about food. But it doesn't say anything about she cooked. Now, the other thing this woman said is that Jesus came and said, you know, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath and blah, blah, blah. And the Pharisees were upset that Jesus was healing people on the Sabbath. Well, guess what? It, by all rights, that's anachronistic. In other words, that was injected back in because the writers of the Synoptic Gospels were in a later time, many decades later. You know, the temple's been destroyed. Judaism's in chaos. You know, the Romans have killed like a million Jews and and these Pharisees are made out to be these evil monsters. But the reality is there doesn't seem to be historical uh, validity to what she and many others say about the Pharisees being pissed off about a healing happening on a, on the Sabbath. There are certain ex there are certain exemptions in Sabbath law about um things that you can do that seem like work but it's to help like in other words if somebody let's say somebody somebody fell in the street and cut themselves on a knife or a sword and they're and they're gonna bleed out the, the pharisees didn't have a rule that you have to watch your loved one bleed out in the street because that would be work to save to to you know to, to provide medical care so that's a ridiculous teaching. And the idea that the Pharisees were this weird, special, super legalistic class of people is also an anachronistic and just a mistake. The Pharisees were just Orthodox Jews. And again, yes, I know that there's some dispute about what Orthodox Jews back 2000 years ago taught about specific things and how strict they were and so forth and so on. But under under nothing I could find and I challenge you to do the same. Is there some rule that you're, you're not allowed to hand someone a sandwich if they're in your house and you're, oh, can I have a glass of water? No, it's work to pour a glass of water. Like, I don't, I, I, this is completely made up stuff. Like, they, it wasn't like the Jews were prohibited from eating. 
they were prohibited from cooking. And she was right when she said they were supposed to prepare and cook meals the day before. But there's nothing in the text that says that this woman got up and cooked. Nothing. She's just making that up. And Christians do this all the time. They just make stuff up so that they can make a pronouncement about what it was. Now, she ends with saying, like, you know, after talking about stuff she's just pulling out of her butt, about stuff she can't possibly know because it's not in the text. She's she's just injecting her, her view as if it's the gospel truth. And then she says this woman, well, she didn't care about breaking the Sabbath because she was just rejoicing and so happy. Now, first of all, she wasn't aware of all of Jesus's teachings. He had just started his ministry. She didn't have the New Testament. It's not like she had studied, oh, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, so I can get up and cook a meal. So I pretty much guarantee you that, being as these, these were all Jews following Orthodox Judaism, including Jesus and the disciples, I pretty much guarantee you that Simon Peter's, Simon Peter's mother-in-law, if this story is even true, got up and started breaking the sabbath that's just ludicrous it's it's a ludicrous assertion now to say that she was happy and rejoicing because jesus healed her well like, i don't believe jesus healed anybody i think these are all just stories but let's imagine let's grant jesus did heal her from a fever would she be happy and would she rejoice okay fine now the text doesn't say that but if you're sick and somebody magically heals you, yeah, you'd be happy. So I can grant, okay, she was happy. But to then say she was so happy and so excited, she broke the Sabbath in front of all these people and that it got recorded in the gospel as that no big deal, she just broke the Sabbath, is ludicrous. Now, in this case, it's not, I mean, like it doesn't lead to that weird of, you know, I don't, I don't know that anybody is necessarily teaching on these verses. Hey, go out and break the Sabbath because Simon Peter, his mother-in-law, did it without a problem. Although, of course, Christians don't observe the Sabbath because why? Well, Paul came along later and completely bastardized the Jewish teachings and created his own, his own cult. That's a different teaching. But the point is, you can, you can listen to the, what this woman says. You can... Just read a little bit of history, ask yourself a few questions, do a little bit of research on your own. Don't take my word for it. Go read the text yourself. Do a little Google searching or ask ChatGPT about the Pharisees and their beliefs and find out, were Jews allowed to eat on the, on the Sabbath? I, I think you'll find yes. They weren't, they weren't forced to fast every Sabbath. And does, it, does the text say the woman cooked? No. Does the text say she served them? Yes. Was serving somebody a sandwich allowed? Well, unless you're gonna unless you're gonna argue that babies and young children were forced to fast for 24 hours, then obviously a woman giving her child, like nursing her child, does that work? Like I don't know. I've had some kids and and yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a woman and I never nursed a baby, but I, I've bottle fed them. And it's beautiful. I, I love feeding my kids with, with, even though, I don't know, you could argue about whether, how healthy that was giving kids formula. Um, I had, well, quick personal aside. I had, I, I have three kids and two of them are from my first marriage and one was from my second marriage. In both of those cases, in both of those cases, um, there were problems with breastfeeding. And so, so none of my three kids, and they're all smart and all college educated. They're all nice people. I don't think they're brain damaged, but they were all bottle fed formula. Reason, reason, reason. Um, what ended up being an interesting thing for me, as much as I, I wanted and I was hoping that they would, you know, breastfeed for at least six months or something and bond, bond with their moms, that uh, the, the benefit for me was I did a good portion of of feeding my children you know because they were on formula and so i bonded with them through feeding so I'm, I'm not in any way applying it is you know it's work it's a beautiful thing but ask any nursing mother yeah it's freaking it's freaking work sometimes <laughs> it's not like just this easy thing now did the sabbath prevent nursing mothers did they force their newborn infants to fast for 24 hours obviously not so nursing a baby was not 
breaking the Sabbath any more than giving your two-year-old who's eating solid food a sandwich or whatever they ate back then. And so if your husband or your son-in-law or your kids or adults and you're like, oh, here's food, that wasn't work. They, she wasn't breaking the, the Sabbath. Like, hey, pass me a napkin. Get it yourself, dude. That's work. Well, I can't get it either. That would be work. I mean, I guess I have to, I can't use a fork. I got to eat like this. Come on. So the stuff, the stuff Christians say sometimes is ludicrous. And again, um, anyways, this is going a little bit long. I'm going to end it here. I think I'm going to end it here. What else happened? Well, Jesus, Jesus healed. Many in the town came and, and he healed stuff like this is a, this kind of standard thing. We don't get a lot of details. And Jesus healed of many of their infirmities or all of their infirmities, depending on who's interpreting the text. The the takeaway from this, the takeaway from this is listen to what teachers say. Go read the text yourself. Do a little studying, whether you got a Google search or chat GPT or ask a rabbi or ask some people that understand Hebrew. And and then come up with some of your own conclusions about where the problems are and ask yourself, why do Christian apologists have to either obfuscate, lie, misrepresent? And, and why do they, why do they, why do they contradict each other so much? How do two people, two teachers both claim that they're reading the same text and receiving revelation and, and wisdom from the same Holy spirit, but then they come up with different teachings. How is that possible? And who should you trust? Anyways, I think I'm done with this one. It's interesting. Again, if you're following along with this, the point is that not that, oh, I'm this great teacher or that I'm even a teacher at all. It's that I'm looking at the text and I'm studying about the history and I'm studying, I'm looking a, l- a little bit into the um, Jewish traditions and the Christian traditions and how different people interpret it. And I'm asking myself, like what really happened, what, what's actually true, and can these conflicts actually really be resolved in logical ways? And I don't think they can, but if you do, great. As long as you've done the work, I can respect that. What I don't respect is when you're mouthing off as if you know what it says and you're better and smarter than everyone else and you can't steel man the other guy's side, even if the other guy's another Christian, never mind what the atheist says, the other Christians think you're full of shit. I guess you could say they're not real Christians, the fallback position. All right, I'm out of here for this week's scripture scrutiny. I do hope that if you're if you're following along with me that you develop a new desire to investigate and be inspired by the history of this and you know, it's interesting study. That's why that's why I'm doing this series. Thank you. It's been- Yeah.
Que quiere este perro probar tu sabor, tu sexo de amor. Me imagino que ya tiene un bicho que te pone en Gucci, Fendi, Tom Ford, pero por favor, dame por lo menos un chance.